Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We'll start with a silent meditation. So if you could sit in your chair, sit up straight, your feet flat on the floor, and relax your shoulders, please. Please join me in Gasho. Namo Mitabutsu. Namo Mitabutsu. Namo Mitabutsu. Namadats, Namadats. So, good evening, everyone. If we could join my enchanting, we will be chanting uh, the Juice Gay, which is on page 55 of the Red service book from Hawaii or on the PDF? Gagon Chose Gan Jodo Shigan Fermanzo. Sepu jo shogak ga o muryo ko fui dai se shu fu sai shobing sepu jo Gashi Jobutsudo Myosho Chojipo Kukyo Mishomon Sefu Joshogak Dio 
Bok Jin Shonen Joe Shubong Yo Shigum Jodo Namadats, 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 Namadats.
Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me in chanting. For those that have come in a little bit later, uh, Michael has allergies and maybe I have allergies. I sound like a frog chanting tonight, so I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with chanting is like a singing voice that uh, early in the morning and later in the afternoon or evening, I should say, uh, your voice really is affected. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, so tonight what I'm gonna do, to, instead of doing a formal Dharma talk, I'm gonna do more of a reflection on something that happened here to me more recently in New York City. Uh, for those that are maybe not quite familiar with uh, what my position is, is that I am the minister, excuse me, my voice, <clears throat> not only for the Ekoji Temple in Virginia, but also for the New York Buddhist Church and also for Seabrook. And so I do live in Manhattan. Uh, for those of you that are unaware, we do have a beautiful temple here, Upper West Side in Manhattan. And so um, I do live completely in the city. And so my lifestyle has changed radically because when I was living in California, I had my own home in the suburbs. And here I am, I'm living in the temple and I'm not complaining, but I do get a lot of knocks on the doors and you do not know what to expect. And so uh, this week was a very sad experience for me because I had someone knock on the door and I have a video monitor and unfortunately, I, I was the only one in the building. And so there's knocking on the door probably about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I push the button and the guy's going mushy mushy, which is hello, hello in Japanese. And, you know, I'm able to speak some Japanese. So I said, I'll be right down. And I go downstairs and this gentleman does not speak hardly any English. And I was very fortunate because we do have several English, uh, Japanese speaking people in our congregation here, our Sangha. So I called one of them and this gentleman had just lost his wife. And um, they had come and picked her body up and he goes, where's my wife? Where's my wife? And so this is the kind of situation that you deal with when you live in a temple. So, you know, fortunately I was able to have a Japanese speaking person talk to this gentleman and give him some comfort. And so right now here at New York, even though we're in New York, I'm dealing with a lot more of these situations where uh, they're Japanese, you know, exclusive speakers that I have to be, have to accommodate for. So he gave me, you know, it was a real eye opener on about how we can express compassion to our members, whether they're the English speakers or whether they're Japanese speakers. And, and also I've been uh, reaching out into the community and I've been meeting a lot of different people. And um, I was introduced to an interfaith community. And so I thought, okay, well, this is a good opportunity because Reverend Ikeda, my, my professor, you know, here at the temple was very good at doing outreach. And so I thought, okay, I will do outreach and go to this interfaith as well. And um, I went in and it was really funny because, you know, in New York, I don't know if you're aware, uh, but the Jewish population in the metropolitan area is larger than the whole state of Israel. So there's a, obviously a very large Jewish presence in New York City. Um, also a lot of other Buddhist groups and of course all of the Christian geo groups. So I was at this in, invited and it was a very informal tea and I sit down and I'm introduced to these people from the Hindu community. I'm introduced to these people from other Buddhist faiths. And then they said, this is Reverend Rai uh, from the Buddhist Church of New York. And then people looked at me because I was new. And I was like, oh, and they go, oh, we have a lot of questions for you, Mr. Rai and our Reverend Rai. And I go, oh, OK. <laughs> so I'm like, OK, I'm definitely being put on the spot. And the reason why I'm sharing this conversation with you tonight is that sharing uh, these ideas about what is Buddhism and how it relates to these different spiritual traditions, what is similar and what is different, really brought up a lot of issues, uh, especially from the people that were from the Catholic background, which was the, for some reason, the majority of the people that were in present, that were present. So I have a lot of uh, very devout Catholic friends in the Bay Area. So when I was going to the Institute of Buddhist Studies, it was not uncommon for me to meet up with my friends and them asking me questions about what is it like going to seminary, what they call seminary, what we would call you know, into Institute of Buddhist Studies. So, so they started asking questions about, you know, do you believe in God? And this is a huge question. And I'm bringing this up because I'm hoping that we will have this as part of our discussion tonight. Um, as Buddhists, as you'll hear that there's a thread through my conversation tonight, because I'll talk about um, having a Zoom meeting next week with someone at a Koji whose um, eight-year-old child is being ridiculed at school because they're not Christian. And so this is kind of the thread that's gonna be going through my talk tonight about what is common with the Buddhist tradition and you know, what, what are the differences? And so, you know, so they said, you know, do you believe in God? And 
one of the things is, is that we know that, uh, you know, and in, in, in we are Buddhists, and so the primary teaching is the Buddhist teachings, and so we do not have this emphasis on a deity. Uh, and so when I first started out, they say, do you believe in God? And I'm, I said, well, I don't, we don't believe it in doctrine, and it would offend a lot of people very quickly. And so what I learned very early on is, is that I would put the question back to the person. I would say, what does God mean to you? And I would say, especially when you're in a metropolitan area like the Bay Area or here in New York, people do not think of God or think of him as a, a he, so to speak, behind the clouds with a white beard, which is the idea that a lot of people have in the fundamentalist community. And they go, oh, you know, God is being with love. God is love. And so, you know, and one of my friends in, in San Francisco explained to me, they go, you know, being in heaven, going to heaven is not this wonderful place in the clouds where you're with Jesus and everybody, you are part of God and that hell is not being with God. And so when I heard that explanation, it's something that I think that as Buddhists or someone that comes from a Buddhist background can relate to, because what you're talking about is not this dualistic, theistic idea of this something separate from ourselves is talking about that, that God is part of us. And indeed, one of the things that kept coming up in this conversation with one of the Catholic members is he talked about he said that the whole point of Christianity in his point of view or Catholicism in his point of view is being loved by God and accepted being loved by God. And this was his point of view. And so, again, you know, for someone coming from a non-Christian background, how do you relate to that? How do you have a conversation about that? Um, and so I, I started talking about the concept of non-duality. Um, which, uh, you know, can sound very academic on the outset, but I told him the idea that, because he agreed, because he said that I identify God as love. I identify God as not being separate from me, that the idea is that, that, that there is this presence of love. And so we talked about the concept of Buddha nature. Um, and again, the idea that there was the historical Buddha, because a lot of people do not realize that there was a historical Buddha. Uh, they think, you know, that the Buddha, they read all these stories or they think about the, the fat man in the Chinese restaurants and they have all these ideas or stereotypes about what a Buddha is. And indeed, if you read some of the texts, I mean, we do have these wonderful sutras that are talking about the Buddha seeing through walls and appearing here and, and materializing in different dimensions. But I said, you know, that the idea that there was a historical Buddha that lived, that reached enlightenment like anybody else is able to. Um, really hit a chord with this person uh, coming from a Christian background. But the idea that when I expressed the concept of Buddha nature, that the idea is that we're not focusing on the physical person of Shakyamuni Buddha, we're focusing on the idea of what enlightenment is itself, is what it was the, pro not the process that Shakyamuni went through, but what was the outcome of that, which we cannot uh, explain intellectually. We've got all these wonderful sutras that try to explain it in metaphor and stories, but it's very individualized on how we understand what this understanding of what enlightenment is. And so for him and the other people in the group, uh, typical in any, any group, there's somebody that's more dominant than the other person. So the, the Catholic gentleman was the one that was asking the most questions. And so he says, well, then if you, you know, so then we all have this potentiality of Buddha nature in this. And I said, yes. And I said, I have met Catholic priests that I feel personally are enlightened. Now, does that mean that they are Buddhist or that they are enlightened in the concept or the boundaries of what we think about as Buddhism? No, but these pers this person or these people have gone through the spiritual path where they have reached this certain point of understanding that goes beyond intellect and is incorporated into their lifestyle. You know, and I know I never had the pleasure of meeting Thich Nhat Hanh, um, who I loved his writings. Uh, he was a very gifted writer. He, English was not his native language. But you would read his books and you would understand that his English wasn't perfect, but he would get to the core of the ideas. And I was very fortunate to have friends in Seattle that in the late in the mid 90s or late 90s actually got to go to a retreat uh, with Thich Nhat Hanh uh, down in California. And their experience was is they are awestruck by him, not that just simply by how calm he was, how gentle he was, how uh, that you could feel the presence of the Dharma or how, you know, with him. They didn't like his entourage talking about Plum Village, you know, please make donations to Plum Village, no offense, Michael, you know, we have to do that. But, you know, they said that he was separate from that and that, that they had this groundness that they could tell. Because when you talk about, when you read the sutras about the Buddhas, that when he came out of the samadhi or the deep meditation, uh, that when he 
uh, when the fellow travelers that abandoned him because that he started eating and they felt like he had given up the spiritual path, they could tell without him saying anything that there was something different about him. This condensence is what they talk about, or his presence or his calmness was something that you could see and feel. And that's what I'm reflecting upon in my personal view, that I've met people from different spiritual traditions and they have that essence with them. So in my personal view, and sorry if BCA is listening to our Dharma talk tonight, that's what I feel that they have reached an enlightenment in their different form. So, so the idea, so they're talking again, getting back to my, my discussion earlier this week with uh, the, the, this informal interfaith community. Um, you know, so they're saying, well, can you give us an example of what a Buddhist teaching would be in everyday life? And one of the great experiences, and you've heard me many times before refer about my first assignment, which was at the Fresno Betsuin, which is in Fresno, California. And just so people are aware that Fresno, California is in the middle of the Central Valley, which is uh, the breadbasket, so to speak, for the United States. 80% of our produce and some of it goes to the world comes from the Central Valley. So Fresno in itself is this metropolis of about a million people, but everybody that surrounds it, there's hundreds of miles of farm. So it's a very different type of environment. Um, and when it comes to spirituality, very fundamentalist, uh, born again country. So uh, the Fresno temple was very large. Um, the Junior Buddhist Association, which is Junior YBA, had over 60 members, which is almost the whole membership of a Koji, but think about that with just the youth. And so, you know, we would try to have them do activities in the community. And I'll be very honest, uh, like a lot of our Buddhist Churches of America temple, I think a lot of our membership is middle class or above, college educated. Um, and so this is not any different at Fresno. So their parents had been farmers, but they were going to college, they were dentists and, and physicians. And so, the idea they we had a homeless shelter in Fresno, actually very close to the original temple downtown, which is now longer part of Jodo Shinshu is a, a Burmese temple. They sold it to a Burmese group. But this was in the middle of the old downtown, which had a lot of homeless population. And this is before COVID. So um, I can imagine what it's like now. But uh, so we had the homeless shelter and they would serve meals three times a day. And so we asked our junior YBA, our, our teenagers, would you like to go and serve a meal? And it was an interesting experience for them because this was going out out of their comfort zone. And many of the members knew that I had worked with the homeless previously in Seattle. So they thought that it would be a good idea for me, not only as a Buddhist minister, but as a former social worker to take these kids and show them the reality of what it is like to live on the streets. And so we go there and they're wearing their junior YBA shirts. So they're very self-conscious about wearing the shirt that identified them as Buddhist. And I said, no, this is a great thing because people need to see in the community. We know that we're Buddhist, but you know, we are an unspoken of tradition that a lot of people overlook because we don't you know, advertise, so to speak. So they go in there. And the first thing that the response from the people that we're serving, the homeless people, and again, Many of you are aware, you know, we're serving elderly people, we're serving families, we're serving children. It's not just the stereotypical bum row, you know, alcoholic type stereotype that a lot of people like us to think about. It's like it's a, a part of our humanity, a part of our current American society. People um, lose their house they, because they lose their job. And so these are the people that are being. And so here we are, the high school students are serving and they're going, hey, you're Buddhist. That's really cool, man. And you could see the reaction from uh, the kids because they didn't expect that, first of all, to be identified as Buddhist and then that, that it was accepted. Because as I've mentioned in other Dharma talks at the same time, I had a student that came very tear-eyed to me because um, one of her co-students found out in high school that she was Buddhist and she said, you're gonna go to hell. You know, you're gonna go to hell. And so my poor junior YBA kid came to me crying because what do I do about that? So here they get affirmation for being Buddhist. But then when we finished, part of the Dharma lesson wasn't just giving the food. The Dharma lesson was, is what is your experience? You know, what is your perception of who the people are, why they are here? So we go out and we go into the, the temple literally was three blocks. The old temple is three blocks from the center. So we walk back. And I take them and I put them in the hondo to kind of remind them of the traditional Buddhist atmosphere. And I said, 
well, why do you think these people were homeless? And a lot of the stereotypical things come out. Oh, they're druggies or they're alcoholics. And I am not going to downplay in the homeless community. There is a huge substance abuse problem. There's no denying that. And then I, and then people say, well, they want to be there. And I looked at them and here they are. You know, these kids are like the top of their class. They're going to go to a, a good university. They're bright. I go, who would want to be homeless? And you could see the wheels going around in their mind. And they said, uh, and then I said, and then I started talking about the economic realities is that, you know, that you can get in a car accident, you lose your car, you can't go to work, therefore you lose your apartment and your family is in a homeless shelter. It could be any one of us. And that was a step. And this is why I was telling the people in New York, getting back to this interfaith discussion is like with the kids is like what I wanted them to understand from a Buddhist perspective was, is that we weren't there to help the poor homeless people. We were not there to give them food and make ourselves feel better about doing a service. Our whole point was, is that we could understand that with us, that any of us could be in that exact same situation. It takes one car crash. It takes a parent passing away. It takes someone falling on the street and, and, and hurting themselves and not being able to go to work. But most important also, as we talk about Ed Koji, is that when we do, for those that are lucky enough to come in to the Sunday service, is that you know, when we do Oshoka, we bow to the Onaijin or to the altar, but then we bow to the people that are doing the service. We're not bowing to them because they've done the service. We're acknowledging their Buddha nature. And this is what I was trying to convince to the junior YBA 15, 20 years ago. And I think it's stuck with some of them that, you know, we're not here because we're doing a good deed and we're helping the people that are below us because we realize that the interconnectedness of life that we all have Buddha nature, that we can all be in the situation and that the causes and conditions is that we're here today and hopefully that there'll be another group there tomorrow to help feed these people. Um, and I will say one gripe uh, working with the homeless population for many years in Seattle is that, you know, Thanksgiving, all these volunteers show up, you know, and, and they're, they're sincere. And I don't mean to downplay that, but it's like, where are you on July 4th? Where are you on January 2nd? Where are you on October 20th? It's like this idea of this reciprocal that this could be any one of us. So I thought it was a very good conversation with the junior YBA. And I thought this example kind of opened up to these non-Buddhist people that were in this interfaith community that, you know, sharing the idea of Buddha nature, perhaps like my Christian friend who kept saying, you know, expressing the love of God and just accepting it. I don't think it's exactly the same thing, but there's this idea that there is something inherent that goes beyond us, that is within us, that we can acknowledge in each other. And he appreciated this very specific example of us serving without serving, with us being present, so to speak. So I hope my sharing this discussion with you tonight will open up for us the discussion that we can talk about um, what, it is, what it is like to be a Buddhist in a Christian geo, uh, society, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, I, I still receive a lot of emails from Ekochi um, asking for me to do meetings. And this meeting that I'm going to have next week um, is from somebody that's not part of Ekochi. They don't identify as Buddhist. She says, um, I identify with the Buddhist teachings more than anything else. And my eight-year-old son in Fairfax, Virginia, is getting ridiculed even though he's because people view him as a non-Christian, though he technically is not. Can we have a meeting with you? And I thought, how fascinating that this mother with this young child would like to have a meeting with myself. She was under the impression that I was in, in, in at Ekoji, and I told her it was going to be a Zoom meeting, and she was fine with that. But again, this idea of, that this, of us coexisting together, which we know has caused a lot of political divide, uh, especially in the last few years here in the United States, but you know, the acknowledging and supporting of each other, uh, and for whether for us, as we say, we acknowledge each other's Buddha nature, or whether it's the Catholic person that says that we're sharing God's love is the idea that we're all part of humanity. So if you could please join me in Gasho. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Okay, so if we can go, we would like to do the joint reading, please, which is the pledge number two, uh, which you have in the PDF, or which is 
Reverend okay. Rice, sir, um, you asked me to send out the creed to everybody. Oh, I'm right? sorry. Yes, yes, yes. The creed. You're correct. The creed number two, please. Yes. On page number four. Casting off the self-power mind of the varied practices and disciplines, we entrust ourselves single-mindedly to Amida Tathagatha to save us in regard to the one great matter of birth. With one thought moment of entrusting, we know that we are saved and that our birth is settled. After this, we say the name in joy and gratitude, repaying the Buddha's graciousness. We acknowledge gratefully that we are able to hear and understand this teaching because of the benevolence of our master having appeared in this world and of the successors in the transmission, the good teachers whose world, words were not shallow. Beyond this, we will observe the established rules of conduct throughout our lives. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. If we could please finish with a short meditation. So if you could please sit in your chair, relax your shoulders and your feet flat on the floor. Please join me in Gosho. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namo Mirabutsu. Namadats, Namadats. Namadats.